Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a discussion of the book of Proverbs. We are now in Lesson 8 in that series, and this is the lesson for February 21 of 2015. And it's entitled, Words of Wisdom. And once again, uh, much like our lesson of last week, it talks about the challenges of using good words, bad words, how do words impact our lives, and so forth. So we hope that you have your Bible handy, that you'll be able to check us out and make sure we're quoting the Bible correctly. And while we hope you have your Bible handy, we'll ask you now to bow your heads with us as we ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Our wonderful Father, we have come once again asking your guidance in our study and our look at these uh, words of Scripture that we may interpret them and understand them the way you want us to is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't think I need to tell anyone here, and probably none of you out there, that philosophers have spent a great deal of time trying to, dis to discuss and determine the relative importance of heredity versus environment. While heredity sets certain boundaries in our lives, I will never be a woman, I will never be Chinese or black, uh, I mean, heredity does set a certain boundaries to our, our lives. But there's a lot of more intangible things, such as wisdom, which is what we're talking about in this lesson, that heredity is probably not the most important factor. Our brains are filled with everything we see, hear, taste, touch, and smell throughout our lives. So how do those things impact us? What we see and hear in our modern world is enormously impacted by the devil. You could hardly turn on your television or drive down a major road, in this country anyway, without being accosted by something that is very much opposed to basic Christianity, and I don't think I need to elaborate any more for any of you. Our only safety is by spending more time under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and that would be by reading the Bible, and for Adventists, the writings of Ellen White. So now, let's go back to Proverbs 20. If you've had a chance to read Proverbs 20 recently, how many things can you identify in this chapter that are common to all human beings? Now we're talking about words and we're talking about wisdom. What, what is, let's talk about some things. What things are common to all of us at this table? What things are common to all of us? Can you think of some things right off? Basic, we believe in God. Okay, even more basic than that, we're all God's children. He made all of us, right? It's a very basic. And we believe in God, all of us here. Can you think of some other things that characterize all of us? Well, generally, we're fed. We've got more blessings than most of the world. Okay. Uh, it was even something even more basic than that. I could, we could go out, you could go into a stadium full of people, and I say, there's one thing that everybody in this whole auditorium, all is, sinners. we're all sinners. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, let's be honest about it, right? We are children of God, God created us, but we are also all sinners. So if there's all those things and ways, in, those two ways at least, in which we are alike, and, and I should say, maybe another very important way which we're all like is God has provided salvation that's available to all of us. So, God created us, we are all sinners, but God has made a plan that's equal, equally applicable to every one of us, or at least applicable in one way or another are, to are all we, of us. Are we all sinners by heredity? I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, I mean, Gordon, are we all senators by heredity? <laughs> okay, well, let, let me answer that question very briefly. And the reason I was a little hesitant is because that has been a huge debate in Christianity basically since the days of Jesus. Well, even maybe, well, not quite, but not too long after that. 
whether or not we are inherently evil or not inherently evil, whether we partake of Adam's sin or we don't partake of Adam's sin, those kind of issues. One thing I can say for sure, if you believe, as I do, that sin separates us from God, and that's basically what sin does, so it separates us from God, then we all live separated from God. Not one of us has seen God in person. Not one of us has had a chance to live in the Garden of Eden or stroll down the, you know, the, among the trees with the Lord. Not one of us. Are you talking physically separately? Well, well yeah, I'm, in any way, honestly. Um, we just haven't. We don't, we don't have the option, even if we wanted the option, to go back to where our first parents started. So we are, in that sense, separated from God, which is the basic basic idea of sin. But would that be some kind of an inherited characteristic? Yeah. We have DNA which is defective. Right. Well, but it's, it's, it's not just our DNA, it's a fact that we, we, even if we went looking for it, we can't find mm -hmm. the Garden of Eden. It's not here. We can't go, you can search every part of the world, you will not find it. So you don't have the option, even, even, even if it were still here, you don't have the option of going there. Adam and Eve didn't have the option of going back there. So it's out of our reach. It's just plain, you know, heredity, if you want to call it heredity, the fact that we're born sinners here on this earth, it's not an option for us until well, Jesus comes again. If the Garden of Eden would solve the problem, then all God has to do is just bring back the Garden of Eden and put it over there, and we well, could, you we could you go you fix that up. Do you think that would solve the problem? No. Okay, well then. And I'm, I puzzle why it, why it won't. Because none of us are fit to go there. That's pretty simple. Well, I know that, but I can't quite figure out why. <laughs> 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 okay, but th there's another side to this whole issue now. There are also many ways in which we're different. <clears throat> there are some ways in which we're all alike, but there are many ways in which we're different. I mean, some obvious ways. There are men, there are women, there are people of different races, there are people of different languages. There's so many ways in which we're different. But talking about basic Christianity, what ways are we different? You mean I'm different from Carrie or we're yeah. different from... We don't believe that God's going to torture the wicked for eternity. Okay. But, but even among us here, we have differences. What are, what are some of those differences? We bring our own interpretation by our own experiences that we've grown up with. Okay. And not only that, <clears throat> what, what else can you say about us? Our picture of God can all be different. Yes, very good. Mm -hmm. We have different talents, as we call them. Gifts, spiritual gifts. Every one of us has a different set of spiritual gifts. Are those inherited? Yeah. Well, they're gifts. They're, they're partly inherited, but they're Our probably mostly related, related to heredity. I mean, related to, to environment, things that we learn. Um, so, yeah. And Paul talks about that in great deal in several places. One of the most important places is 1 Corinthians 12. He talks about a body. How is a body made? Not every, not every part of the body can be an eye. You know, not every part of the body can be an ear, not everybody can be a hand, not everybody can be a foot. The body needs all the different parts in the same way the church needs, what, all its different parts. And not all of us can do the same things. We shouldn't even try to do this. Not everybody can be pastors. We shouldn't try to be all pastors. Each shouldn't try to be hands. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, he, he does go on, Paul does go on and say, but there's something in which we all can share, we can all be a part of, and that's, 1 Corinthians 13, agape love. Okay? And if we all had that true agape love, we would work together just fine, even though, just, even despite our differences, right? Well, uh, Proverbs 20, verse 9, talks a little bit about our situation. What do you mean, just fine? We'd all work together just fine, despite our differences. Was Paul working together with Mark just fine when he said, that guy's not going with me? <laughs> yeah, was there no. ever a time when they did work together? Well, there was later on, but okay. 
But uh, what I'm saying, I guess my question is, do we sometimes work together fine simply by working separately? That can happen. And did, I've, did, I've, I've did. questioned, in, in terms of that experience, from Paul's experience, what was the result of that difference? Now you have two teams out evangelizing the, <laughs> the Gentiles and not just one. So we would we would look at that, no, no, you mean Paul, you know, was so upset by that whole thing? I mean, I th we thought he was a great saint. But maybe God allowed that, even though it wasn't such a good thing. Now you've got two teams out there working. Well, look at, look at uh, Proverbs 20, verse 9. Can anyone really say that his conscience is clear that he has got rid of his sin? That's a pretty telling question, isn't it? Well, I would think... You think you know the sin? answer? What sin? We're talking <laughs> sinful nature or... We're talking about... You know, when you, when you sit down with the Lord and you say, I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, isn't it Christian theology that that that's uh, f that, that's forgiven and and that's that's gone? Yes. So well, what, but let let what, me, what okay. You, you let, let me just follow about along. Our inherited sin. <laughs> let me let me just follow up with what you what you just asked. If you took any group of Christians, Adventists, other church groups, uh, Baptist, Catholics. And you sat a group of 20 people down. You said, okay, tell me your understanding of why Jesus had to die. How much similarity do you think there would be? Well, well. according to some of the discussions around this table, there would be a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> and we probably agree more than most groups would agree. <laughs> well, what do we do with statements like this one? If man cannot by any of his good works, this is Ellen White, manuscript 36, 1890, quoted in the book Faith and Works, page 20. If man cannot by any of his good works merit salvation, what does merit salvation mean? Earn, deserve it. Earn it. Then it must be holy of grace. It's a gift from God. In other words, we couldn't manage the plan of salvation by ourselves no matter what we could do. Now, now, are these good works that we do because God is working through us? Or are these good works that we do simply because we do some good works? Probably. Probably what? The second. <laughs> oh, the second. Okay. Okay. All right. So these, if, I'm, this if, gift, I'm, if I'm doing good works through that God has, is, him, is, him, is working through me, then I can merit... Mm -hmm then I can merit? I don't think so. Well, let's wait. Let me, let me read the rest of the quotation. If all this salvation by faith is received by man as a sinner because he receives and believes in Jesus, that's the best way. It is wholly a free gift. Justification by faith is placed beyond controversy. And all this controversy is ended as soon as the matter is settled that the merits of fallen man in his good works can never procure eternal life for him. What does that mean? Not work your way to heaven. You cannot earn a place. You could never accomplish on your own what Jesus did for you. It's just out of the questions, not possible. I mean, the questions he answered in the Great Controversy, just for an example. But what, it, what he did was meant to heal or change and or change our thinking mm -hmm. about God, change our understanding. Yep. Well, if there are things we could do to where we would, quote, merit eternal life, then we could, and I've used this illustration before, <clears throat> we could go up to the pearly gates and just tell St. Peter, stand aside, buddy, I'm coming through, I, I'm entitled to be yep. in here. And I can tell you that I've heard a pastor, a visiting pastor, come here to Loma Linda some years ago and said, when I get there, I'm going to show him my right to be there. Called it, didn't he call it a title deed? I don't I remember. Don't, I think he maybe did. Something of yeah. that nature, yeah. Well, but in, in a sense, that, 
<laughs> we do have a title deed, but it's because God has given us that title deed. Yes. When we show up, mm -hmm. he, he's, he's given it. It's the deed he's given us. But here's the problem. We're saved by faith, but we're judged by works. What does that mean? Well, fortunately, we've never been given the job of judging each other. We're pretty good at trying to do that, but we've never been given that task, fortunately. But we do judge God. Yes, we have been given that job. I've, I've wondered exactly what that text meant. Um, I think we all have. Um, and I've wondered if, if part of it is, part of what it's saying is that we are judged by our works, but others judge us by our works. It's true. And I've, I've also wondered if, and this is the scary part, is if our works are not a litmus of what we are. What we are is manifested in our works. Mm -hmm. and that's scary. It is. That's, I don't like what I see most of the time. Look at, uh, else look at Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13, just for an example <coughs> of what we've just been talking about. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne. This is judgment time. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead. Death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held, and all were judged to, according to what they had done. What does that tell us? It's interesting, before you answer that question, every one of us will be judged ultimately by our works. The same standards will be applied to the people who drowned in the flood, to the people who were burned up in Sodom and Gomorrah, the people who lived in Jesus' hometown of Capernaum, and us. Now, if you don't believe that, read Matthew 11, 21 to 24, and Luke 10, 13 to 14. This should make us very humble and also prevent us from idolizing any other human being. The only thing which we can honestly boast about is what God has done for us. Which is? He's helped me change my works, so my works well, aren't all that bad? Fortunately, God so gave us bad? God gave us the words about that. Let me let's just look at those. Jeremiah 9 verses 23 and 24. I'll give you the good Lord's words. The Lord says, "The wise should not boast of their wisdom, nor the strong of their strength, nor the rich of their wealth. And if anyone wants to boast, he should boast that he knows and understands me." Because this is God speaking, "Because my love is constant, and I do what is just and right. These are the things that please me, I'm the, I the Lord have spoken. So the one thing we can boast about is the fact that we know God. We have the opportunity to know Him, and He's a great guy. You know, I, as you mentioned that, there's um, a classic example of that, uh, I think, is uh, Desmond Doss. Mm -hmm. um, when this when this movie came out about him some a couple of years ago, it was obvious from the movie that he was a very I mean to me anyway he's a very simple guy. Mm -hmm. It even showed some of his handwriting up there, and I don't want to disparage him, but it, you know his spelling wasn't the best, and mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and I and this would be my analysis, and I've I've heard him several times. And the message from him always was that God did this through mm -hmm. me. And, and I've wondered if, if that wasn't why he may have been singled out to have received the experiences that he had in the story was that God knew this guy is going to... Not going to be proud. Well, not only that, but his, his message is going to be just what you outlined there. The message was always about, about God. This, this was God at work 
uh, this was my faith, uh, and so on and so forth. I, I wondered about there it. There was a certain young lady who had nothing more than a third grade education who started a bunch of universities, mm -hmm. publishing houses, wrote many hundreds of thousands of pages of inspired testimony. And why did she get that job? Because two men before her either refused to do it or weren't fit to do it. And it would be my understanding, and I think what you're expressing here is that that that, that was her approach as well, that this is mm -hmm. what God is doing, it's not what yep. I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. Well, there are some people who seem to have ups and downs in their religious experience. Let, let, me, let me piggyback on that okay. a bit. Um, <clears throat> reading in Psalms 50 and 51 I've done recently, and other passages where it seems like that God, what God makes, what makes, seems to make God happy is when people are praising Him. Um, some would say that that's a very narcissistic uh, kind of, a, of an entity that you're serving here. All He wants is, is people to, his, is His subjects to, to praise Him and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. What, what's a, what is a, uh, what's a, what's a kind of a, re a legitimate rebuttal to that? My response, I mean, the way I understand it is, and what, that's what I said right there in the verse is, the reason we can praise Him is because He always does what's right. How can you knock that? Right there in the verse. So, uh, I, can't, I can't say Yoli always does what's right. I can't say that I always do what's right, but I can say that God always does what's right. And that's why I, I love Him, that's why I can praise Him, and that's without, I don't have to be I know, embarrassed but why, about why is Why is He saying, that's what, I, that's what I like, that's what I enjoy as people, be, my subjects praising me? Because He wants us to learn to do what's right. And actually, if you read deeply, that's actually the way that we praise Him. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, a, a, a great examples from the Bible of some of the problems that people have are Esau and Jacob, back from the book of Genesis. <coughs> Esau was one of these guys who was boisterous and he was doing this and, and some moments it seemed like he wanted to be the best person around and then the next moment he's off and he's doing crazy things and he's selling his birthright. And Jacob wasn't like that. He was home, he was steady, he was constant, he was his mother's favorite for that reason. And of course we know what the result was. Um, we, we, we sometimes look back on the experiences of the martyrs and we think, boy, those people are re those were the real Christians, the people who are willing to die for their faith. But the real truth is it's harder to live for your faith than it is to die for your faith. And we're not trying to belittle the experience of martyrs. They, you know, they, were, they were probably living for their faith and that may be why they end up dying for their faith. To be honest, we need to remember that living for your faith is, is the biggest challenge. Like Enoch, think of what the Bible says about him. And Elijah with his foibles. And they never died. Well, look at a couple of passages. Look at Proverbs 20, verse 17. What you get by dishonesty you may enjoy like the finest food, but sooner or later it will be like a mouthful of sand. <laughs> Doesn't that sound delicious? Or as we see, a mouthful of gravel. Yeah, exactly. It's even tougher. Yeah. And look at chapter 21, verse 5. Plan carefully and you will have plenty. If you act too quickly, you will never have enough. What does that mean? You talking about playing the stock market? What are you talking about? <laughs> there are the huh? my financial advisor would say, "That's good counsel." I say, "Don't jump in and out of the stock market. Take the long, take the long. But what is it? A patient investor. Yes. 
Yeah, okay. I'm not so sure about that, but <laughs> patiently wait for disaster. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there are people who feel like the only way to get ahead in life is to be dishonest, even to steal. And God says those people ultimately will lose. Look at a couple more verses. Look at Proverbs 20, verse 21. The more easily you get your wealth, the less good it will do you. My wife has a favorite expression, which wasn't with her, wasn't hers to begin with at all. A lot of people have said this, and she summarizes that verse, easy come, easy go. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about the next verse? Proverbs 20, verse 22. Don't take it on yourself to repay a wrong. Trust the Lord and He will make it right. Revenge is a terrible human tendency, but it's so difficult for us to be patient long enough to let God work things out. And Think of all the examples in the Bible of people who ran ahead of God. Abraham and Sarah couldn't wait for God to give them the son. Jacob and Rebecca couldn't wait for God to given the birthright, and on and on and on it goes. Abraham waited an awful long time. Yeah. So it seems like an awful long time, a hundred years old before he has a kid, but I would, re I would remind you that after Sarah died, he remarried and had six more sons. I've been giving us problems ever since. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, by comparison, look at Proverbs 25. We haven't got to Proverbs 25 yet, but look at 20, Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. How do you understand these verses? If your enemies are hungry, in fact, I'm going to read from the King James because that's one that we're all, you know, the old famous verse. If thine enemy be hungry, give him to bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Shouldn't we just heap the coals of fire ourselves? Wouldn't that be easier? What, is that, what does that mean? I mean, it, it almost, <clears throat> I'm not sure what it means to heap full coals of fire on you. So that sounds like <clears throat> you're doing something that is really get, kind of getting even. It's a little bit of retribution. Well, and here's, God here's, is rewarding you here. Here's my good news translation, which may be a little easier for us to understand. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. We understand that. If they are thirsty, give them a drink. That we can understand. You will make them burn with shame, and the Lord will reward you. What do you do with the, um, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile? Yeah. <laughs> Voice of pessimism over there. <laughs> well, it's, cer Reality. it's certainly true about people, yeah. <laughs> I bet that's in here someplace in Proverbs. Could you say that's what we did as a nation in the Marshall Plan in World War II? When we're a little more focused, now we've lost our way and we're losing everything almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was a movie made that was, almost, obviously it was sort of a comedy, but it was there was a certain amount of irony about this little tiny nation that tried to attack the United States because they said, look, Every nation that the that the United States defeats, they turn it into a superpower almost. You know, they give them all this money and they help them out and they do all those things. You know. Well, we know from Matthew twenty-five the story about the judgment and something similar. Well, Luke 20, Luke ten is of course the story of the um, Good Samaritan. It is interesting to suggest that compassion for the poor may be a better measure of our true Christianity than piety or many other religious characteristics that people look up to. Is that possible? Why didn't Jesus say in Matthew 25, it's not the, the person who's um, you know, feeding the poor that's going to be in heaven, it's the one who goes to church every week or gives big offerings. Don't we think those are the saints? Well, look at a couple more passages. Look at Proverbs 19. This is we're looking at Proverbs 19 and and uh, and 20 here, 2021. 20, look at Proverbs 19, verse 17. When you give to the poor, it is like lending to the Lord, 
and the Lord will pay you back. We already looked at that once. How Think much, that's true? How much should you give to the poor? <clears throat> There's a fellow walking down the... I assumed he was homeless. He was walking down the street in the rain. Mm -hmm. And people hit me up sometimes for things. And so what I've done is I've gotten $5 gift cards to Del Taco down here. Don't tell them because they probably won't want all these homeless people and all these homeless people are coming with gift cards. But anyway, <laughs> where was I going with that? So, um, you know, I gave The guy him, walking down the street, what'd you do with him? Right. Well, I, I gave him this gift card so he'd get out of the rain and get something to eat and even get to use a restroom with legitimately and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Should I have given, oh, I know, should I have given him $10? Maybe $20? How much are you supposed to give these people? Yeah. It says kind in my translation. It doesn't say anything about monetary value. <laughs> I think in those cases it's what you do. What he does is his decision. Yeah, that's what I always think, too. Well, I know, but my question was, did I, did I do enough? Yeah. Well, here's a verse that might help. Proverbs 21, verse 13. If you refuse to listen to the cry of the poor, your own cry for help will not be heard. So if you want to, know, if you want to figure out how much God will give you back, maybe it's you should, that's your measure of how much you should give. Brings it closer to home. How sensitive are we to the needs of the poor? Well, once I again, the question is how, how sensitive do we have to be? Yeah. <coughs> well, I'll, I'll give you my example. I work at this clinic, and we take care of a lot of poor people. And my brother called me this afternoon and said, I have somebody in my office there who needs help. This person is just here visiting from Nigeria and has a serious medical problem. No money. Can I send him down and you'll take care of him? Well, yeah, but you're all set up for that. You've got a clinic, you've got a chest full of medicines. <laughs> <laughs> That's full. And, and, and where, do those all, where does and, all that come from, do you and, think? And Well, I don't know. I got the impression the government funded some of it, but... Yeah, uh, don't kid yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the government pays us legitimately for what we do for them. I'm not saying the government doesn't do something. Right. Yeah. That comes from all of us sooner or later, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But what if, he'd, the, what if he called Jim over there? But where did the old saying come from, give till it hurts? Yeah. I think most of us should probably give a little more than what we do as, as a rule. Well, that, that's not in the Bible, is it? I don't know. It's something I learned as a kid, you know, give till it hurts. It's a mm -hmm. saying that's been around from time immemorial, I think. Well, is, is, is the poor person, the guy walking down the street in the rain, maybe, is he any less a son of God than you are? No. no, but we tend to look down on them, don't we? What does it do for us and our characters to help people like that? Does it do anything for us? I think it does. What? Well, I don't know. I've had one or two episodes similar to what you said. and. I, I, just the fact that you can do it makes you feel good and reminds you that maybe you should do it more. Okay. Is there a certain kind of built-in selfishness that we need to try to get over? Yeah. Does helping out somebody in a bad situation, does helping them out maybe help us a little bit in overcoming our selfishness? I would be concerned if after I had done that, <clears throat> that I was feeling good about myself. Because I don't... I the mean, Bible says that, you, you know, you'll feel better if you do, if you help other people out than if you, and if you don't. So I, I don't think that's a bad feel. But, I mean, I let's hope you're not just doing it so you can mm -hmm. feel good. Well, you, you, you now that, well, I suppose, would be a different story. Pharisaical show off, then you, yeah. know, you don't want to be in that kind of a scene. I think uh, I think um, my thoughts were that I'm I was glad I could be able to do it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take. We, we need to keep moving on. Proverbs twenty-two, verse twenty-six, verse six is probably the verse quoted 
most frequently from, from this chapter. Okay? My good news Bible, well, let, let's read the King James, because that's one that many people are very familiar with. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What does that mean? Well, let me read you another version. Do you think this is more likely to be true? Teach children how they should live. This is my good news Bible. Teach children how they should live, and they will remember it all their lives. I think it's both. It's I, done right. I guess God didn't teach Lucifer very well then. Yeah. By the King James. <laughs> It won't depart from it. Is that's kind of an idealistic approach. I'm going to say from practical experience, that's not a guarantee, but it puts them in the right area. Again, it comes back to their decision when they're an adult. Didn't God do a perfect job with Lucifer and the third of the angels? Yeah. And Lucifer, in spite of that, and the third of the angels, in spite of that, rebelled. The master teacher. I mean, nobody could do any better job. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. A paraphrase of that might be, train up a child in the way he should go, and if he doesn't go that way, he'll live with a guilty conscience all his life. <laughs> he'll be reminded of what he ought to be Maybe. doing. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to notice, if you look at the original Hebrew, which I don't claim to be a Hebrew, Hebrew expert, but if you look at the, original, at the original Hebrew, the word for educate or train the child is actually the same word that was used for the dedication of the temple back in 1 Kings 8 and verse 6. So what would it mean if we use that word? Dedicate your child. How, we, how would we dedicate a child? Well, you do what, you, what a parent can do, only what, what they can, but this child is still free to turn it down. To parents, this is Ellen White's words, Review and Herald, June 24, 1890, paragraph 1. To parents is committed the great work of educating and training their children for the future immortal life. Paul himself may have had that Proverbs 22, verse 6 in the back of his mind when he com commended Timothy for, quote, From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus, quoting the New King James Version. Well, Here's a couple of verses, and I want you to tell me whether you think they're related or not related. Proverbs 22, verse 8. If you sow the seeds of injustice, disaster will spring up and your, your oppression of others will end. Let me read that once more. If you sow the seeds of injustice, disaster will spring up and your oppression of others will end. Okay? That's one of the verses. Here's the other one. Verse 15. Children just naturally do silly, careless things, but a good spanking will teach them how to behave. A lot of violence. My goodness. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, but the, again, it depends on the level of spanking, doesn't it? Yeah. It depends a great deal on, on, on how it's carried out. Exactly. One of the things that psychologists teach us, which has proved to be very true, I've seen it happen again and again, if you're angry when you discipline the child, it gives the child permission to be angry too. Mm -hmm. And you probably didn't teach him anything. So you need to be, when you discipline the child, you might need to be in full control of your own emotions. You might need to say, sit down in the corner for a little while, and then sit down and we'll talk about what you did and why it wasn't the right thing. You might have to spank that child, but you cannot do it in anger or you're just guaranteeing a problem. So education is essential and sometimes it requires discipline. But the most important education our children get is from our personal examples. So what kind of leg legacy are we leaving? May I quote Ellen White again? This is from Child Guidance, page 151, paragraphs 1 to 3. Parents should be models of truthfulness, for this is the daily lesson to be impressed upon the heart of the child. So where is the child learning the most? From what the parent says or what the parent lives? Does. What the parent does and lives. Undeviating principles should govern parents in all the affairs of life, especially in the education and training of their children. 
Parents never prevaricate. This is, this is a comment. Parents never prevaricate, never lie, never tell an untruth in precept or in example. If you want your child to be truthful, be truthful yourself. And I go on. Many fathers and mothers seem to think that if they feed and clothe their little ones and educate them according to the standard of the world, they have done their duty. They are too much occupied with business or pleasure to make the education of their children the study of their lives. They do not seek to train them so that they will employ their talents for the honor of their Redeemer. Solomon did not say, tell a child the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it, but train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. And that's, of course, our Proverbs 22, verse 6. Ellen White's comments in Review and Herald, June 24, 1890. Unfortunately, and we all have seen this, I'm sure, many parents have looked at this verse as if it was going to somehow rectify whatever problems they may have caused by their early education of their children. Well, I took the, my child to Sabbath school, I took care of him, I fed him, I did all this kind of stuff, and I prayed to the Lord, and the Lord promised me that he'll grow up a saint. Right? The verse doesn't mean that? Hmm? If it was that easy. Yeah. So how are we supposed to give our children the best possible education? Do they understand the basic principles of Christianity? And for those in our church, do they understand the basic reasons why we hold as important the things which we teach? Do they see loving, caring, obedient behavior in their parents? There are certain fundamentals <clears throat> that lead to success. And uh, it, even though you may not, you may be for whatever reasons, um, not the most financially well off, <clears throat> if you instill in your children principles of honesty, integrity, faithfulness um, in all things, uh, in relationships to people as well as to God, that that pays off eventually. And you know, sometimes people come to this country as immigrants, <coughs> and I think this is often the case. They come here for a better life, mm -hmm. and uh, some are bitter because they don't get a better life. Um, others, and I'm thinking of I don't know why I'm thinking of Lee Iacocca, but I am. Um, I'm not See, sure he's... had a better life. <clears throat> well, that's true, but he didn't come here. His parents came here. So the parents may not have realized the better life for themselves, but they realized the better life for their child. Mm -hmm. So... Can I give you another example of that? <clears throat> I know the story of a... never didn't, didn't know this person personally, but I know the story about a man who came here, worked really hard, started a business, the business became very successful, probably a multimillionaire, I assume, and he was raising a son. And when the son got to be about 20 or so, and had finished most of his education, probably had a college degree by this time, he said to his son, okay, <coughs> I'm, I want you to start at the bottom in my business. I'm going to give you an alias, Nobody will know that you're my son. And when you have worked your way up to be vice president, the business is yours. Mm. What do you think of that? It's a good idea. Many times from one generation to the next doesn't, it, it's many times it's generation skipping. Like many times the, what the father does, the sons don't do. Mm -hmm. Well, so many of the emphasize, emphases in our world today are on immediate gratification. Even the media focus on sound bites. I mean, why should we take more than a few seconds to focus on something, right? Where are the wise instructors that lead nations to stand up for principle and look to the long-term results of their behavior? Why is it so hard to recognize the intangible rewards of wisdom? 
how can we keep our, can we help emphasize to our children the importance of learning to do what is right because it is right, and not just because someone else is doing it, sounds like a teenager, or because of fear of punishment or hope of reward, like an even younger child. How do we do that? It is essential, if we are going to have successful Christian lives, to use wisdom and good judgment. I mean, isn't that what God expects of us, right? All you have to do is look at the daily newspaper or watch the news to see the results of bad judgments or decisions made by others. But just as automobiles and homes have very different values based on quality, excellence, safety, reliability, even location, humans are also judged by similar standards. Let's take an example. Think of Paul and Silas singing in that Philippian prison. How could you possibly sing under those circumstances? I mean, everybody else around you is cursing and swearing, and they're singing. Why were they singing? Often I see people, when they see children in Africa, they have nothing, they're barefoot and they're running and singing, saying, how come those people are singing? <laughs> I've asked that too. I mean, what are they singing about? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Children in Africa, Africa, let me tell you, can be very creative. Yeah. They can make wonderful toys out of a tin can. Oh, yeah. I know. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, this, this is a, a, a partial answer. Mm -hmm. Um the the things they were singing were probably what we would call today as hymns mm -hmm. and and um at least in their own culture weren't they psalms and they had tunes yeah. and things like that and these were things that were committed to probably to memory it's it's easy to remember yeah. songs when they're when you have words when you have music with them and maybe they didn't have any scripture so they may have used these in part to have some kind of a of a scripture, yeah. Um, so th th I mean that's that's well, one. I think that's only one part of the reason why they made. How it. you 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 got your hands out. I mean, some people say that that they had they had blocks of stone set at about forty five degrees, and you got your you're almost crucified. You know, your arms are out there and your feet are bound up. There's absolutely no way you can get even half comfortable. What do you do? I mean, how can you possibly sing in that situation? Well, maybe the songs were an, sort of a distraction. Take your mind off things. Yeah. What else can you do, right? But the thing that made it possible for them to sing is undoubtedly their relationship with God. They knew that God, even if they died, it, would be, it was in God's hands. It was an opportunity to witness yeah. as well. And they did a good job of it, didn't they? <clears throat> so, back to Proverbs before we run out of time. What are we supposed to learn from Proverbs 20, 21, and 22? Well, Proverbs 20 focuses on making wise decisions in life. The drinking of wine is discouraged because it beclouds your thinking, certainly your decision-making capacity. Discipline is encouraged. Verse 30, we talked about that a little bit about spankings. It tends to make people think more clearly, at least after they've thought about it for a little while. <laughs> Throughout this chapter, we encourage to think clearly, to know where to start, to know when to stop a given activity, and even when to say no. We are to learn how to recognize good counsel, to exercise common sense, and thus, as the Bible repeatedly emphasizes, Learn to be humble and aware of our own shortcomings and thankful for God's watch care over us while He searches our motives and our thoughts. True, faithful Christians will have lives marked by transparency, patience, and firmness. How many people do you know that have lives that are marked by transparency, patience, and firmness? Don't everybody jump up and give examples <laughs> just like that. Well, Proverbs 21 continues the lesson from the previous chapter by it talks about habits that destroy good judgment. 
Let me give you some lists. And, and, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in this chapter. Proverbs 21 is a list of intellectual and emotional habits that, when indulged, cripple one's judgment. The list is rather long, but the underlying principle is clear. You lose judgment when you indulge in vices. Can you think of an example? Drink and drugs. Someone who drinks. Drugs. And especially if you drink and drive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can lose all kinds of, you can lose everything by doing that. Text and drive. Yeah. <laughs> or even driving when you're really sleepy. Or text in when you're walking against a crosswalk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <I see> that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the people who love vices are proud. Versus this is Proverbs 21. Now we're looking at verses 4 and 24. They're hasty. They're dishonest. Um, let's just look at a couple. Dishonest. See if verse 6 says, The riches you get by dishonesty soon disappear, but not before you le they lead you into the jaws of death. And look at verse 7. The wicked are doomed by their own violence. They refuse to do what's right. And verse 28, the testimony of a liar is not believed, but the words of someone who thinks matters through is accepted. Does that sound like good advice? There are other people who are crooked. Guilty people walk a crooked path. The innocent do what is right. You think the innocent always do what's right? Well, some are contentious always arguing about this or that or the other thing. Well, what about this? <laughs> Proverbs 9 and 19. Better to live on the roof than share the house with a nagging wife. <laughs> <laughs> this wouldn't be gender biased, would it? <laughs> I have that underlined. You have that underlined. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> Not that it's relevant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> Why is everybody looking at Myra? <laughs> <laughs> Proverbs 21, verse 19. Better to live out in the desert than with a nagging, complaining wife. How come so, there aren't any admonitions like that for men? Oh man. you know, for women, better well, to, I'll, for a I'll, woman I'll to do this you, than to put uh, up with a... When I hear people say that, I say, you seem to have forgotten what it says in Matthew 5. Remember what's in Matthew 5? It talks about men who look across the street and desire to possess a woman, boy, I tell you, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty stiff, I mean, that's just one of the many things there. Anyway, what about people who are desirous of evil? They like evil. Wicked people are always hungry for evil. They have no mercy on anyone. They're scornful. Look at the next verse. When someone who is a conceited gets his punishment, even an unthinking person learns a lesson. One who is wise will learn from what he is taught. What about the wicked? When justice is done, good people are happy, but evil people are brought to despair. What does that tell us? And my cursor seems to have just disappeared. There it is. Um, Going back to that nagging wife, maybe the message... We there, don't need to focus on that, do we? <laughs> maybe the message there is that if you were what you should be as a husband, you wouldn't be having a nagging there wife. It is. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility, a good possibility. <laughs> Way to dig, our, dig us out. <laughs> <laughs> there are people who have no compassion. There are people who are corrupt. There are people who are distracted. There are people given to pleasure. Maybe we should read that one. That sounds a lot like our day, doesn't it? Proverbs 21, 17. Indulging in luxuries, wine, and rich food will never make you wealthy. You have to be wealthy in order to do it, right? <laughs> People are wasteful. They're overconfident. They're loquacious. They're sting lazy, stingy, and greedy, hypocritical, cold-hearted, and against God. The underlying principle is that you cannot have good judgment if you enjoy vices. This is why a leader must be a person of character who has a compassionate heart. And let's look at that verse as a sort of conclusion to this particular chapter. Proverbs 21, 21. Be kind and honest and you will live a long life. 
others will respect you and treat you fairly. Okay? Well, why do people like to sin? Why does vice hold such a grip on some people? Well, maybe I should say all of us. Why does vice seem to flourish in large cities? Well, while you're thinking of that, since we only have a little time left, look at Proverbs 22. For example, wisdom helps, helps you to recognize danger and avoid it. Look at verse 3. Sensible people will see trouble coming and avoid it. But an unthinking person will walk right into it and regret it later. Try another one. Uh, wisdom helps us to be humble, to know how to educate a child. We've talked about that. To be generous. Look at Proverbs 22, 9. Be generous and share your food to the poor. You will be blessed for it. It helps us to have a pure heart, to know and how and when to speak, and to enjoy God's protection. In stark contrast, folly brings only sorrow in its toe. By pursuing earthly riches, many find their lives filled with emptiness. Look at Proverbs 22, 8. If you sow the seeds of injustice, disaster will spring up and your oppression of others will end. I think your, your oppression of others ought to end, right? Uh, if you have uh, you see, there are people who have lust and discover that they have become oppressors. Solomon calls upon the reader to become wise by listening. What an incredible idea. Trusting God and seeking knowledge and truth and working hard. They are to avoid becoming like those who, as a result of hating wisdom, seek out the company of rich and powerful friends who have no judgment. Well, in light of all this, we need to think about what Paul said in Philippians 3. We don't have time to read that now. By any normal worldly standard, Paul, Paul there talks about his background. By any normal worldly standard, Paul should have been on top of his game. I mean, he was a Roman citizen. He had the very best education going on and on. But he counted all that as nothing but dross in contrast with the value of getting to know and love Jesus Christ. What would happen a group of Seventh-day Adventists Christians today were willing to commit themselves to spread the gospel as Paul did in his day? Or is that even possible in our day? I recently had a chance to trace some of Paul's steps and see the places he walked. I think not many of us are prepared to do that. Isn't that too bad? Maybe it's your turn. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word and to study it and to learn from it. May what we say be a blessing to those who listen is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.